You know, today is the last day of the month already. We we're already finished with three months of 2019. Whoop, just like that. Uh, next month is Good Friday and Easter, and whoop, we're in May, and then whoop, uh, Memorial Day, and whoop, we're into the summer. And so it just goes and goes and goes and goes and goes. Uh, next thing you know, it's going to be 2020. Um, so, uh, as was prayed to, today is my last Sunday here. Um, and so maybe, well, I'll share a little joke. I read a blog post of a pastor. He said, uh, talking about if being a pastor, and he was sharing a story that a pastor announced that he would be leaving the church soon. And then after hearing that news, everyone in the congregation just spontaneously in unison started singing the hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Saying that like, they're so thankful that he's actually going to leave the church, that Jesus is their friend and like, answer their prayers. Uh, Maybe that's some of you today. I don't know. Uh, and uh, hopefully not. <laughs> then I'll be, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be sad. Um, so uh, in the afternoon, sirs, we've been going through a series called uh, A Church of Disciples uh, that began last month. Uh, and we were going through some various passages in Luke. And since today's my last Sunday, we're finishing this series. And part of the reason of choosing this series is because of our overall church theme, of uh, disciples making disciples, or being disciples and making disciples. Now, naturally, uh, since the word disciple is not used in regular everyday language, you have to ask, okay, what is a disciple? And so to answer that question, I have on the screen uh, a definition from Merriam-Webster, so hopefully it's reputable. And Merriam-Webster says this, a disciple is one who accepts and assists in spreading the teachings of another, such as a convinced learner and follower of an individual. Now, a, basically saying that a disciple is a learner, a disciple is a follower. Uh, a disciple is a person who imitates and learns from the person being followed. Uh, a pastor out in Washington, D.C., uh, in a book that he, he's written on disi discipleship, discipling, says this about being a disciple. Being a disciple of Christ does not begin with something we do. It begins with something Christ did. Our discipleship to Christ begins when we hear those two words and obey him. Follow me. To be a Christian means to be a disciple. There are no Christians who are not disciples, and to be a disciple of Jesus means to follow Jesus. There are no disciples of Jesus who are not following Jesus. So if I'm in this room and I say I'm a Christian, it means definitionally that I am actively following Jesus. That's what it means, being a Christian. And I follow Jesus because of what he first did for me on the cross. Uh, that's, that's baseline. And so we're going to look into these famous last words of Jesus uh, in Matthew 28 and just kind of tease out even more what does it mean to be a disciple and what does discipleship mean. So before we do so, uh, do you mind joining me in prayer? And I'll just pray for all of us. And as I pray, just please pray for me as well. Father, we thank you for your mercy and grace. It is limitless. It is unending. And you continue to lavish upon us like this crazy, awesome waterfall as you describe in Ephesians 1. Lord, how can we say we deserve anything? Because we do not. Because we are sinners who do not deserve your grace or mercy. We deserve justice. And that justice is apart from you. And yet, Lord, because you love us so much in Christ, you, have, you had Christ come down for us. And through faith in Christ, we are saved. We can then become disciples of Jesus. So, Father, as we look to these last words in the Gospel of Matthew, in the book of Matthew, Father, help us to have eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts that are open and ready to respond to your word. Father, may it be that I would be faithful to your word. Not really my, my own words or anything I try to come up with, but just to be faithful to your word when we ask that it would just permeate deep into our hearts. Father, again, we just thank you for this opportunity to be in your word and to praise you. It's in Jesus' name we all pray. Amen. Now, if you were to have 
a final moment with people you will not see again for a while, or maybe not again in this life, what would you say? What would be your final words? And then, maybe as you're thinking, I would say this stuff to these people, or this person, then why would you say that? Now, I'm not trying to sound morbid here, but you know, if sometimes you're going to maybe send someone off, or not see them for a while, or uh, they're going to pass on from this life, what are you going to say to them? Uh, I think you would agree with me that last words have an impact. Right? Uh, last words can be memorable. Uh, I'll give you a couple examples here. Uh, from the noted uh, person, musician, uh, Bob Marley, his last words are, or famous last, money can't buy life. Uh, I think, good advice, uh, money can't buy life. Um, from the famous Renaissance extraordinaire, Leonardo da Vinci, uh, his famous last words are, I have offended God and mankind because my work did not reach the quality it should have. It seems a bit modest. It's like, well, you made some really nice, awesome stuff that people pay lots of money to see and to borrow and all, the, all those things. Uh, the uh, noted starter of what's called communism, Karl Marx, had this as his famous last words. Last words are for fools who haven't said enough. Uh, sounds a bit bitter uh, from him. Now, obviously, that's real life. And then if we watch entertainment, like movies and TV shows, uh, we can see multiple examples as well, can we not? In terms of famous last words. So if you're especially uh, a Marvel Cinematic Universe fan, with the Avengers movie coming out literally in a month, basically. Uh, last year's movie, Infinity War, after, uh, I guess I'm going to spoil the movie if you haven't seen Marvel movies, uh, when a lot of the heroes start uh, disappearing, so to speak, uh, they have some final words. And then there's words spoken, and you're like, oh, right? But then, you know, next month's movie, they're all going to come back, so uh, that's what's going to happen. <laughs> so uh, I don't think that's much of a spoiler. Uh, in Matthew 28, this is the last chapter of the first gospel of the New Testament, Jesus has risen from the dead. All right, that's the first part of, 20, of chapter 28. So basically, the first Easter Sunday has occurred, and that's no small thing. People don't just rise from the dead. And in verses 9 and 10 of Matthew 28, we see Jesus' first words to the ladies who saw him uh, after he came back to life. So it's on the screen here, Matthew 28, 9 and 10. And behold, Jesus met them, the ladies, and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. So Jesus tells these ladies who went to, because they thought he is dead, and, and they want to just go prepare his body uh, for just long-term burial, uh, he, they see him, and he tells them to go tell his disciples, his closest followers, to meet him in the region of Galilee. Because Jesus is going to have some final words to say to his followers. And uh, if you've grown up in church, you have any Christian background, you know these final words in Matthew 28 are called the Great Commission. So in a certain sense, maybe you've never thought about this before, uh, Jesus is basically having a graduation for his followers, and he's going to give a commencement speech to them, to send them out. And so let's go to verse 16 to set the stage for these final words from Jesus, shall we? Verse 16 of Matthew 28 says this, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. Now if we were with the disciples at that time, and we're just observing them, right? we're like, it's like, the camera and the author, they're just following the people. What would they be feeling? What would, what would we see as they talk to one another? They're going to this region to see Jesus for the first time after uh, he resurrected. Because the last time they saw him, he was tortured and crucified. And he was basically executed as a criminal against the Roman Empire, and they all ran away. They said, uh, I think we're done, we're not going to follow you. So they did really, I would say, a poo-poo job of following him. 
They're like, like Peter's like, I'm going to follow you, I'm going to follow you. Jesus like, no, you're not. Peter's like, yes, I am. Jesus says, no, you're not. Peter says, yes, I am. Jesus says, no, you're not. And Peter didn't. Peter denied him. And Peter's like, oh, no. But now what? He's alive. So the ladies come, they tell the disciples, hey, Jesus is alive. So I would think on some level they have some excitement, no? That he's alive again. And they're talking, what does this mean? Right? Okay, all the stuff that he said before, we get to see him. So then as they go to the region and see him, what happens? Well, verse 17. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Now, I don't know about you, in reading this verse, because we can easily gloss over it, I am struck by the different responses from the disciples. Because you, you have some of the disciples who... When they see Jesus, they worship him, and they're ready to go. So in the Korean sense, oh, Jio, right? Wow, you're here. But then you have others here. It says some doubted. And probably for those disciples, they're not named. Okay? So, so basically, they're hesitating here. Like, all right. Is that really you? It's, it's not some ghost, right? And then they might be thinking, well, why don't you prove yourself to me that you're really alive? Like someone's pulled a trick on me. Now, you and I reading this think, well, what a bunch of idiots. All right, how can they not just start worshiping him? But before we, can, before we quickly criticize these guys and for being doubters, for lacking faith, if we really think about ourselves, if we're honest with ourselves, I think we'd probably react the same, don't you think? Because there are those of us here, if not all of us, who are disciples of Jesus who still wrestle and still struggle with doubt, no? It's a natural human response. And so rather than roast these guys, like, how dare you? Like, I, I told you, 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 why didn't you believe? Jesus just kind of go, just takes that and he begins his final speech in verse 18. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now, how does Jesus have all authority in heaven and on earth? Well, he's what? He's the God-man. He's God and man who rose physically and bodily from the dead. So he's not just Savior, he's also Lord. He's also Master. And so the guy who's been teaching his main followers about God and showing them the way. The guy who willingly sacrificed his life for others. The guy who gives love and forgiveness to everyone who follows after him. The guy who's alive again. This guy is giving his final command. And this final command isn't just for these disciples. Because some people think, oh, it's just for these guys. No, no. This final command is for us too. For those of us here who claim to be Christians, who claim to be disciples, who claim to be followers of Christ, this, these final words, this final command of Jesus is for us to consider as well. So what's this command? Well, let's go to verse 19. Verse 19 says, Go. Therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Verse 20, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So what's the command? Some people might think, oh, it's go. But actually, the command is to make disciples. So if you are taking notes, or you have your phone, I would suggest to you, either with those two words, make disciples, you highlight, underline, circle, just emphasize those two words, make disciples. Because that's the main point of this sermon. That's the main point of these verses, to make disciples. So please repeat after me. Disciples of Jesus make disciples of Jesus. Okay. Disciples of Jesus make disciples of Jesus. Here's another quote on discipling. Discipling, or making disciples, is deliberately doing spiritual good to someone so that he or she will be more like Christ. It is helping others to follow Jesus. 
So being a follower of Jesus, being a disciple means that I will, over time, help others to follow Jesus. Being a Christian, a disciple means I will make disciples. It's going to happen. I will duplicate. I will replicate. I will reproduce Jesus' followers. And here's the truth. Whether you are a Christian or not in this room, everyone here, everyone here is making disciples while also being discipled. All of us here are influencers. We influence others while also being influenced as well. Okay, if you have a favorite sports team, you know, the Dodgers just started their season. So hopefully they make the World Series again, and hopefully they'll win. Or you have a favorite movie or a series of movies. Or if you have a favorite music genre or a favorite musician, you probably, I would think, want to influence others to follow you because you were influenced as well. You like this, so you want others to get into it. So like for me, I want my wife to appreciate the University of Texas, especially the football team. It's going to be a long process, okay? I don't know. We'll see if I succeed. Now, parents are influencers of their kids. So even a parent, a dad or a mom who's absentee, will influence their kids just as much as a parent who's involved in their kids' lives. Everyone's an influencer. Nobody here is an island to himself or herself in this world because we are relationally connected. We are social beings. So the command that Jesus is giving to us as disciples, is to make disciples. But then there's a relevant question here. How? Okay, to this command, okay, how do I make disciples as Jesus would tell me to do? Do I, after this service, just walk up to a random person, be a disciple, make disciples? I did it, Jesus. Be a disciple. Make disciples. Is that what it is? Probably not. So then how do you and I do this, making disciples as a foundation of the Christian life? Well, Jesus, because he's God, he knows. He tells us how we can make disciples. Three ways here. Here's the way number one. We make disciples by going. We make disciples by going. Okay, verse 19 says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. So making disciples begins by taking the active initiative towards others. That's what he's meaning here by go. Now, how does any relationship begin? If you think about all the relationships that you have, especially your significant other relationship, how did that begin? Someone took the initiative, right? Someone took the initiative. So if, for those of us here who have a significant other, how did your relationship begin with that person? Was it randomly decided by some lotto system? Like, pff, pff, you two together, okay. No, I don't think so. Either, if you're the guy, you took the initiative and say, oh, hello, would you like to go to dinner with me? Right? Or maybe it's the lady. She's like, oh, and then starts talking to the guy and touches his arm. Or maybe it's someone else. Someone introduced the two of you together. It's likely that nobody was some, that, that everyone was passive. Okay? There was at least someone being active and in initiating and continuing that relationship. There's no passivity here. So here's a question for all of us as Christians, as disciples. Who among your social circles can you help to follow Jesus? Because this is a command. Go and make disciples. So if you are married here, you begin with your spouse. And if you have kids, then you go to your kids as well. But beyond our families, our nuclear family, who in this church can I initiate and continue in a discipling relationship? And this is going to take time. Why? Because if we read in the Bible here, if Jesus spent three years with a select group of men, three years, basically almost every day with them, do you think that having a couple of events a year is going to do the trick and making disciples? I don't think so, no. 
It takes what? A consistent and persistent and active as you live your life relationship with others that makes discipleship a possibility. Okay, I'm going to say that again. It takes a consistent and persistent and active, active as you live in your daily life relationship with others that makes discipleship a possibility. So then, in terms of making disciples by going and initiating, being active, what are some practical steps? What are some practical steps in making disciples as you go? So if you're taking notes, I would suggest you get ready, because I'm going to try to be really practical here. That's my final thing before I go. Consider, I would strongly urge you all, first to be in a small group, if you're not in one, but as you are in a small group, to really consider and push for and do and have joint small group gatherings. What do I mean by that? So like a UG small group with another UG small group, meet. UG small group with a remnant small group, meet together. And as you meet, like, here's my, because you guys are the older, more experienced crowd, okay, mature crowd. Okay, to the younger folks, like the afternoon service, In your small group, consider inviting one or two of the other small groups of the younger crowd over to somebody's house or find like your apartment complex with like the little clubhouse and have a meeting together. And I would suggest do some icebreakers, do some activities for people to cultivate relationships with one another. Because if you don't have contact points with one another, it's going to be hard to do discipleship, to disciple one another. I'll give you an example. So last night, the remnant leaders attempted, keyword, attempted to, to throw a surpi- surprise farewell party for me. Attempted. How do I know that they attempted but were not totally successful? Well, I was, we were visiting one of the students uh, down in Irvine, and then, and then she had, like, the first thing she says to me is, I heard that you're leaving. It's like, oh my gosh. And so then, because she wasn't here for service when I made my announcement, so I just naturally asked her. So uh, who told you? Like, how did you find out? Well, I saw on Facebook there's this event, you know, blah, 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 blah. I was like, oh. Oh. Oh, tell me more. Tell me more. And then she's like, oh, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, oh, okay, okay. <coughs> she feels bad. And then, because um, we had it at an apartment clubhouse uh, that Elder Andrew actually lives in this complex, my wife, last Sunday, Elder Andrew was sitting in front of her. He was talking to a couple of the remnant sisters, like, oh yeah, so it's going to be at my place, our place, and blah, 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 we're going to have. And, and then the girls are like, and he's just going on and on and on and on and on. Okay. So, so you know, uh, it was, so it wasn't a total surprise, but still it was, a, and on some level, a surprise nonetheless. So I'm very thankful to, to them for uh, hosting and organizing that. But you know what I was kind of observing last night was, uh, because some of the UG folks, especially the leaders, were also present, that uh, a good number of the UG folks were talking and engaging in conversation with the remnant folks. And you know what? I was super encouraged by that. And my thing is, continue that. Please, continue that. Don't just make it some one-off party that through your small groups, you've got to be creative. Please do that. Does that mean it's going to be pretty crazy rambunctious with all these people and your kids and all that? Oh, yeah, it will be. But I promise you, the costs are worth it in that. And that leads me to another practical suggestion, and it's this. Consider in the future, right, as the two groups hopefully get to know one another better, to really kind of push that forward, consider having some intergenerational small groups. Interge- what do I mean by that? So mo- the small groups, as they are comprised right now, or you know, you guys are in small groups together, so people who are usually married with kids. And then the younger crowd, they, their small groups are comprised of a bunch of college or post-college, post-grads. Mostly, most of them are single, uh, meaning they're not married yet. As weird as it might be, Having intergenerational small groups, people in different life stages and ages, has a tremendous witness to one another and a power of the gospel that you wouldn't be able to believe unless you really sit in and experience that. 
Here's an example from my life. So when I was in college, uh, we had one of the married couples, one of the lay leaders, and then his wife was actually a treasurer at that time. They decided to be small group leaders and host an intergenerational small group. So they had, in the small group that I was a part of, we had married, married couples, we had post-grad singles, and then we also had college students like myself. And here's the crazy thing, okay? At that time, they had two kids and a dog, now they have five kids and a dog, okay? But while they had their two kids, they decided every Thursday night for one semester, they opened up their place and we all came over and the wife cooked for everybody, okay? She cooked for everybody. So we enjoyed just hanging out, eating, catching up, and then we would have some time of just singing together and learning together, and then the guys would break up, break out, to their own group and share and pray, and the ladies would do so as well. The married couple would lead it. And if that wasn't enough, this married couple decided during the semester, you got every Thursday, every Tuesday night, they schedule to bring one person in the small group over to their place just for some individual time. Again, cooking for that person, and then just, so I got to go one time and just got to talk to them, and we got to know each other better. Now, I've been in a lot of small groups, but that one I was a part of, it still makes an indelible mark in my mind and my heart. And even that couple to this day, they still do that. And how do I know? Because I see that on Facebook. Okay, their eldest daughter, she's in college now, but they're still doing that. And it's crazy that the mom and the dad are hanging out with their daughter's friends. And their friends are okay with that. But how did that happen? Because they took the initiative, the active going to cultivate relationships with people and attempt to make disciples. And, that, and the fruit of their work is seeing how their daughters do in ministry now. Here's another suggestion. Maybe this might rub some people the wrong way. Those of you who are older leaders, I would strongly encourage you to periodically attend the services and the events of the younger crowd. Ministry of presence by showing up and participating together has a powerful influence in the long run. It does. Just by your mere presence and people seeing you, like those of you here who are older leaders to go to the afternoon service here and there a few times and just being there and then being able to engage with the younger crowd, that will make a difference in the long run. I promise you that. I'll give you an example on that regard. Okay, our brother Deacon Lamont. Sorry, Deacon I'm going to use you as an example. It's a good one. Our brother Deacon Lamont, he has been faithful just reaching out and serving the younger crowd as best as possible. Has he been perfect? Probably not, but he's trying. Last summer, Labor Day weekend, we had a retreat just for the younger crowd, for the remnant crowd. And Deacon Lamont, uh, because he had some uh, issues, personal stuff that he needed to take care of that kind of came up, he wasn't able to make it. Now, without me saying anything to anybody in the group about him not being able to attend, because he helped with planning some stuff, at least five, maybe almost ten of the young adult remnant people just came up to me and were asking, hey, uh, is Deacon Lamont coming? Or is, he, is he coming? I mean, I thought he was going to join us. Now, why would they ask that? I would venture to guess it's because he, Deacon Lamont, along with Ms. Jenner, have taken the time to try as best as possible to get to know people the younger crowd. And at times, they have actually attended the afternoon service. They've shown up. And they stay for, like, meals and stuff. Now, here's the thing. Especially to those of you who are leaders here, if you have zero desire to do this, you have zero desire, then I'm going to say, something's off. If you have zero desire to want to engage with the younger crowd, Here's another suggestion. Consider inviting someone to join you for a meal, join or join you for a coffee, or join you while you do errands. For those of you who are husbands, maybe at times your wife asks you to go to the store and to buy some stuff. And then you go to the store and you, you're wanting to buy whatever your wife... I, I, my wife's already done this to me. Can you buy this? And then uh, you make a purchase and it's probably wrong. And then she, you know... It's like, I didn't want that. And so then you're like, okay, I don't know. So you take pictures. 
right? Things like that, or other errands, or if you're gonna, because you're gonna, everyone has to eat, consider, which is gonna take some time and effort to reach out to someone younger and invite them over, or go out somewhere, or invite them over to your house and have a meal with them. See who might have similar vocational interest, right? Younger people want mentorship, right? Maybe you have similar hobbies with the person. Consider reaching out to that person. You and I have to create contact points for relationship and intentional time together. I mean, if you think about the business world, they have the word called networking, correct? Right? You're meeting people. How much more so in the church? I'll give you an example for myself. What I've tried to do since I've been here, because at times I've taken trips to NorCal, I've actually taken a trip to New York to speak at a retreat. I've also other times uh, went down to the OC, different places, visiting campuses. I, at times, try to ask some of the young adults, hey, why don't you join me? Let's just go. Just go with me. Like, there's no agenda. So in the car ride, on the plane ride, we can talk. Over meals, we just talk. All right, we go to the hotel room, we talk. And we're just getting to know one another. So, in a sense, be creative and how you can leverage your weekly schedule. Okay, everyone is busy. That's a fact. But that doesn't negate the weight of the responsibility for all of us as believers to go and make disciples. And I will also say this, the weight of the responsibility is on those of us who are older Christians. Titus 2, 2 through 6 says this, Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young woman to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Now, if you're an older person here, you can complain all you want that that's not fair and the younger people need to do their part. But from Titus 2, the issue is not about reciprocity. It's about you and I taking the initiative and actively going to interact with younger folks. And Titus 2, I would argue, is crystal clear as to who has the responsibility. So if you are a part of the UG, Part of your responsibility is to reach out to the remnant folks. I firmly believe that. If you are, for those of you who are in remnant, your part of your responsibility then is to reach out to the youth and to the children of this church. You don't get absolved of any responsibility. And I will argue with anyone till I'm blue in the face, till Jesus Christ takes me to the grave. But here's the thing. For those of us here who are younger, if you are a younger person, you also... You and I also are to be a good example to older Christians. 1 Timothy 4.12 says this, Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. So if you're a younger person here, okay, you don't get to sit around passively. Okay, you are called to be an active example and reach out to older folks as well. It goes both ways. All right? Jesus tells us to make disciples by going. Amen. Mm. <laughs> Here's number two, how we make disciples. We make disciples by sharing the gospel. We make disciples by sharing the gospel. Let's go to verse 19 again. It says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, I doubt that many in this room have actually baptized another person. However, Making disciples means I participate in the activity of baptism. Now, what do I mean by that? Baptism is a public declaration of a person's commitment of faith to Jesus and being a disciple and a follower. Baptism is the starting block on the journey of faith and following Jesus every day. So then, how does a person become a Jesus follower so that they can become baptized? Well, that person then has to first receive and believe the gospel. Okay, then if we, ask that, if we answer that, then how does a person receive Jesus and believe in him? Well, it takes someone to that person to share the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Romans 13, 
uh, 10, 13 through 17 says this, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him? Will they believe in him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? How are they to hear without someone preaching or sharing with them? How are they to preach unless they are sent as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of those who preach or share the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So Paul here in Romans is saying that sharing the gospel with others will lead to disciples being made. Okay, so then with that in mind, how can I, I, myself, practically do this to make disciples by sharing the gospel? Well, you and I can share the gospel again and again and again and again with both believers and non-believers that we know. So we invite people to our small groups so that they can see the gospel at play, whether they are Christian or not. We can constantly preach the gospel to ourselves and to others in this church. It is the message of salvation that guides us and empowers us. And then also, I would argue that you and I need to demand that those of us up here, like myself right now, ought to preach being tethered to God's word, the Bible, and clearly preach Jesus Christ crucified, dead, buried, risen for our sins. It's the gospel. And then I would also give another suggestion. I would strongly encourage everyone to participate in the monthly GCC Street Evangelism, to go out and share the gospel. Right? That's a partnership that we can have with the Korean speaking side as one church. We talk about we're one church. And then not just that, but then you and I have the opportunity because God has given us the means living here in the South Bay of California, of LA, to participate in missions as a sender or as a goer. Okay, people can't be baptized until they believe Christ in his gospel, right? So then you and I ought to, if I say I am a disciple of Jesus, to have a desire to make disciples, which means that I gotta leverage the gospel inside the walls of this church and outside the walls of this church. So we make disciples by going, being active, and also by sharing the gospel. Amen? Amen. Thank you. <laughs> okay, here's the third thing in terms of making disciples. We make disciples by teaching the Bible. We make disciples by teaching the Bible. Verse 20 says, Teaching them to observe all, all that I have commanded you. So a disciple, a follower of Jesus, a Christian, is one who obeys what Jesus teaches in his word, the Bible. So making disciples means we teach what Jesus has taught. So we don't just meet together, when we meet together and gather together, to talk about sports, as great as sports is, our families, as great as our families are, or some other interest all the time. Okay, all those, there are a lot of great topics out there, but we don't, when we meet every time, all the time, talk about just other stuff. You and I must be spiritually intentional in order to cultivate supernatural relationships and community. Please repeat after me. I am a teacher. Turn to the person next to you and say, I am a teacher. Say to them, you are a teacher. <laughs> now, all of us, all of us here are teaching and influencing others on a certain level, are we not? So the question becomes whether I am being intentional and in being a teacher. So my responsibility to others in this church is to help teach what the Bible says, no matter my title, no matter my experience, no matter my quote-unquote knowledge. It's not about my education. It's not about my skill set. Okay? If you are a disciple in this room, you say, I'm a Christian you have the ability and the opportunity to teach. You do. And actually, you have the responsibility from what Jesus says to teach and to be taught. So then practically speaking, what steps can you and I do to teach and be taught the Bible? Well, here's one thing. You and I, especially those of us older to younger, we can apply the Bible to practical life stuff when we meet together. So those of us who are older, if we are reaching out to someone who's younger, it's not that every time you meet, okay, let's turn to Habakkuk, let's find it in the Old Testament, and 
Let's read this together. Do you understand what this is? I don't know. Do you? I don't know. Like, you don't have, that's not, that's not what discipleship is all the time. Part of discipleship can be you have your wisdom, you have your experience, you have your skill set, you have some knowledge, like life. To younger people who don't have as much life, you can just, when you reach out to them, okay, what does the Bible say about money? Right? Let's read through it. How we handle our finances. Okay, then let's talk about how do I pay my taxes? Okay, that's a practical thing. How do I handle credit cards? How do I sign up for credit cards? Okay, how do I set a budget? You can disciple others in that way. How do I create a resume? How do I conduct job interviews? How do I go about buying a car or a house or renting my first apartment? Okay, how do I navigate romantic relationships and engagement and marriage and kids? You know who can do that? You guys. And if you are a younger person, younger person, you know how you can teach older people? You can teach older, more mature people how to use the latest modern tech. Right? This is a hashtag. Right? You can help older, more experienced believers to understand current cultural trends in music and fashion and movies, yada, yada. Right? And if you are a younger person, you have the opportunity to bridge the generational and the cultural gaps in the immigrant church, just like GCC. This does not require being a Bible expert okay, and reading, like I say, like Habakkuk all the time. This is about what, a desire to interact with others with the word of God as a guide for our lives. And this is a lot more fruitful, I think, than just watching YouTube videos about how to learn about life hacks. Okay? Here's one other thing in terms of teaching. You and I have the opportunity, and we should consider strongly to create one-on-one -on -one or smaller group settings to read the Word or a good Christian book together. So what I've done personally since the beginning of this year, I've met with about five or six brothers and we have every Friday evening, almost every Friday, we have gone through a book called Knowing God Together just so that we can help one another to know God better. And then we've also talked about what we've been reading in scripture. We've talked about the sermon that happened that this past Sunday and we just try to encourage one another to read the Bible and read a good Christian book together. And then while we meet, we have an opportunity to ask questions and learn together while also keeping one another accountable to be in the word. Anybody can do this. You can do this. A pastor in Chicago says this, why read the Bible one-on-one -on -one with another person? We do so because of our convictions about the power of God's word. When people are exposed to it, they find salvation in Christ, they are sanctified in faith, they are trained for effective ministry, and they find community and a web of relationships that are unlike any other the world has to offer. Here's one final suggestion, I'm gonna, and I plead with you to really consider and do this in terms of teaching one another. It is to schedule a regular time of community prayer. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, for we are to pray without ceasing. Okay, making disciples and not just something we do. It is a supernatural process, right? Which means we must ask for supernatural empowerment. So my earnest ask for all of you here, and I'm going to ask the younger people too at 2 o'clock, is to have a scheduled time of prayer so that everyone, I mean everyone, and especially the leaders, can gather together to pray from God's word especially with this plan to merge the two groups together, if there is no time of regular concerted prayer just to pray together during the week or at least monthly or every other week, I think something is off, no? If we don't desire to have some regular time of prayer because we want God to do some supernatural work, then I would argue that in terms of unity in the long term, it's not going to function. It will not. So my plea is, we got to pray, or you got to pray, and so do I. Now, GCC sisters and brothers, you and I are called to make disciples by going, sharing, and teaching. Okay, my prayer, okay, my prayer, if you're still listening, my prayer is that you desire this on some level. You desire this. I hope that you will joyfully accept this challenge that Jesus gives to us. But then here's one final question. Why? 
Why? Make disciples. Well, the end of verse 20 says what? And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Because Jesus is with us always, and because he has ultimate authority, you and I can make disciples. And if we go back to the gospel, think about who Jesus is. Jesus is the ultimate disciple, right? That he took the initiative. He went. He came down from heaven to earth to reach out to us. Reach out to us sinners who did not want anything to do with him. He came down to us. He went. He was active. And not only that, he baptized. How did he do that? He shared the gospel, which is himself. He shared himself with us. And not only that he shared himself with us, he shared himself with us to the point that he went to the cross. He went to the cross, took all of our sins, all of our shames, past, present, future, all the times that we're looking for affirmation from someone else, all the times we feel selfish, all the times that are evil in our hearts, all the things that are wrong and messed up. He said, I'm going to take that so much more, and I'm going to give you life, and just follow my teachings. Follow my teachings and teach others. Say you believe, declare me a Savior and Lord. He initiates, initiated with us, and he continues to initiate with me or you. No matter how far or how close you think you are with Christ, if you believe in him, he has you. Amen? So here's my final plea. In light of the gospel, to you all here in this service, disciple those who are younger, not just your kids. Yes, your kids. Yes, an amen. Yes, an amen from Deuteronomy 6, but so much more. Please don't just think about your own group here. Think about this whole church. There are other groups here. Love this GCC family. Don't just love the undergrace ministry. Love this church family. And don't be a consumer. Be a provider. Love this church. And as you grow in love for Christ and you grow in love this church, you will then desire to make disciples and reach out to other people. The Bible promises that. That's my final words to you all. Okay? I don't think I'm going to die tomorrow, like those other guys who I quoted earlier. But I'm not going to see most of you for a while. And so here's my earnest plea. Please make disciples. I want to end with this and to have some time of prayer. So I'm going to ask the praise team to come up, uh, if you don't mind. Or just have some music. I just want to do this. Um, I just, let's put it up on the screen. I have some couple of prayer topics that I think we should all pray about. Right? The first is, am I a disciple of Jesus? Am I following him? Then yes or no. Then why? And then if I say I'm a disciple, Who am I discipling? Who can I, if I'm not doing it right, who can I disciple? So let's pray for these things, and then I'll have one more thing, and then I'll close this out.